liberty and charity. Heard around the world on your Android and Apple mobile devices. A new book argues that smartphones are rewiring childhood and causing an epidemic of mental illness. Let's discuss it. Mental health and smartphones will also have some practical solutions to help combat the problem, all within the big picture of our Catholic faith today. On this simple truth, we consecrate everything to the sacred heart of Jesus through the immaculate heart of Mary and the pure, strong heart of St. Joseph. I'm Jim Havens. It is Wholeness and Healing Monday, fighting to to cultivate the health of the whole person, mind, body, and soul. With our co-host, my lovely wife, Becky Haven. She is a Catholic wife and mother with a passion and calling to educate people about the importance of caring for our bodies that the Lord has blessed us with by living a healthy lifestyle. She helps others to think outside the cultural norms and to be their own advocate while not falling into the many pressures of modern medicine. She's the author of Toxin Free in 12 Months, a 12-month guide to help you transition over to a toxin-free lifestyle. Also wrote a boycott list of over 600 pro-abortion companies. You can get both those resources for free and much more over at her website, safehavensmama.com. Again, topic today, mental health and smartphones. Disclaimer, we're not doctors, not scientists, just regular people looking to live well and raise our family. We believe in objective truth and in asking questions when things do not make sense. We're not giving medical advice, but we do want to offer a forum here today. We know a thing or two, but there's still a ton we don't know. We have some personal experiences, as do you. We would love to hear from you today. We're going to get the survey responses in. If you're on the email list, you got that survey earlier today, the Monday morning survey. If you want to get on the list and you're not yet, you can go over to the Simple Truth webpage at thestationofthecross.com and sign up there. Uh, But it's always best to call in. We're going to put out the phone number in just a few minutes. We can't get to every survey response, but we would love to hear from you uh, live on the air if you want to call in any question or comment. Again, that phone number coming up soon. But Becky, let's get started here in the discussion on mental health and smartphones. I'm excited to uh, share some information from this book to help kind of stir some conversation here, some pondering of what we're actually looking at. But when you just even first hear that topic, mental health and smartphones, where does your mind go? What sort of associations do you make? What comes to mind? I would say for the most part, it's a negative association. Um, It seems like you know, the phones can be used mostly um, in a disordered way is kind of what we're seeing. I think we're all guilty of overusing our phones and, you know, they're attached to us. We rely on it so much and it happened pretty quick. It, it was like all of a sudden they didn't exist and now they do and everyone has them. And that's how we do so much of uh, our daily life on. You know, it, it has become such a part of us. There's so many things that I don't personally like about having a phone that is like a computer and I can see why people kind of write it off. It's not inherently bad, you know, um, but I kind of liked, I kind of liked the world before they existed. I will say, I feel like it was a little bit more carefree and um, less reliant on the, you know, knowing everything at the drop of a hat and, I feel like probably health anxiety went way up, you know, after, after people having their smartphones, because you can look everything up and you're going to find all sorts of crazy stuff online. And I think there's a serious mental health crisis, you know, attached to smartphones um, for the most part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mental health and smartphones today. That's the topic. Uh, let's go to uh, some of the data here from this new book that is out by Jonathan Haidt. He's an author, an NYU social psychologist. The book, The Anxious Generation, How the Great Rewiring of Childhood is Causing an Epidemic of Mental Illness. So in that book, he argues that there is a smartphone driven great rewiring of childhood that is causing an epidemic of mental illness. Uh, and, and he's saying that the rapid adoption of smartphones and the rapid spread of social media among teens in the years 2009 to 2011 that you can point to that. He says the data also shows there is a causal effect for how much time you spend on social media and how anxious and depressed you are. 
Uh, so we're, when we're talking about smartphones here, um, you know, we are talking about computers. These are not just phones. In fact, uh, their use as phone is one of the, I guess, um, the minimal uses of what it really is used for. It's really a delivery system. It's it's a computer, really a delivery system for the internet and for social media in particular. That's what most people are doing on their phone. Texting as well is a big part of it. Uh, but let's just think about the timeline for a minute. So you have the internet uh, that was coming up in the 1990s, the advent of the World Wide Web and user-friendly web browsers like Netscape Navigator and Internet Explorer Remember those? And then the flip phone, first flip phone came out, the Motorola StarTac in 1996. Then the first iPhone came out in June 2007. And in June 2010, well, in 2010 in general, only a few children began to have the iPhone. Um, it, it was a, a small amount, but then the great majority at that time had flip phones. Um, but by 2015, you see that it, seemingly everybody had the iPhone. 70 or 80% of teens had it then in 2015. And so that's why the author is calling it here the great rewiring of childhood. Uh, the, pre, the Pew Research Center survey uh, from 2022 of American teenagers ages 13 through 17 says the following, that 95% of those ages 13 and 17 uh, through 17 in America, 95% have access to a smartphone versus um, it's a 22% rise from 2014, 2015. 98% uh, of ages 15 through 17 have access to a smartphone. 91% ages 13 through 14. 91% of boys have access to a gaming console at home. 97% of uh, American teenagers 13 to 17 say they use the internet daily. 46% say they use the internet almost constantly. Up from up 24% from 2014, 2015, 35% say they're on social media almost constantly. And 55% say the amount of time they spend on social media is about right. So think about that. 46% saying they're on the internet almost constantly. 35% saying they're on social media almost constantly. But then 55% saying that their time on social media is about right. Only 36% say they're on it too much. So they don't even realize that they're on it too much when they are. 54% say it would be hard to give up social media. Only 18% say it would be very hard. Uh, but obviously that is the reality for so many. Uh, Becky, when you hear these statistics and you start to look at the, think about the timeline, how it lays out, um, what, what comes to mind then? Yeah, I think you're missing in your timeline the BlackBerry phone. You remember that phone <laughs> that was like the, you know, the calendar of all calendars. <laughs> I remember a lot of the old men used to carry them around and it was like their planner. And even that, in my mind, was like a distraction. Um, people who had it and they would carry it on their hip. And I was like, oh, you're like glued to your phone worrying about your calendar. Um, that was 1999. So that was a long time ago. And I can't imagine going through middle school, grade school, middle school, high school, um, even college for me, I didn't have a smartphone in college. Um, with a smartphone, I feel like it would have been a disaster, which is what it's exactly like right now. You know, um, I'm so grateful that I didn't have that to make things harder. And I mean, it was hard enough. And I think pagers were in in style at the time. A few of my friends had pagers and that was just about all you had. And I think by my college years, I had one of the just simple flip phones and I'm grateful that we didn't get smartphone. We were like on the, the later end of getting smartphones. We already had kids and, um, you know, way into to having kids and immediately it kind of was a distraction. And I was like, yeah, I, I really feel like this is really dangerous. Um, and so I feel so bad for kids who have that pressure of getting it. You know, if you go to school, it's most likely every kid in your school has one, whether they're able to bring it into the school or not. Um, that's the distraction they're, they're up against. And you, we all know what comes with, you know, kids having a phone and the internet and what's available now for these kids before it was just like, maybe a kid on the bus would bring, uh, like a bad magazine or, or something that was, you know, they shouldn't have had, you know, and that was bad enough. But now imagine what these kids are having to deal with, what they're exposed to at such young and early ages. And now 
what they have to be healed from, you know, the trauma they're going to carry. And oh my goodness, I just, I feel like, you know, if you can protect your kids from, from having this for as long as you can, and then slowly introduce how it would properly be used instead of just giving them the pressure to here, just take one. And they have no idea how to use that. Um, we even struggle with how to properly use that. So how are kids going to know, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great points. And we would love to hear from any parents today in particular in regard to how are you navigating this? Are you seeing uh, the challenges of this, the dangers of this? Um, and how are you striving to address it? Anything that you would like to share with us today about your personal experience when it comes to mental health and smartphones or just anything in general along these lines that you're noticing, one 511 5483 That's 1-877-511-5483. I think it's very important to have uh, some discussion around this topic, have an open forum around this topic where people can speak freely. We did put it out in the survey. We asked, what effect do you think smart smartphones are having on mental health? Here's a couple other responses. Christine in Nor Northborough, Massachusetts says it affects how we think and how we treat each other, especially within children's makeup and development. It gives parents a false sense of security, allowing their children to be on technology and ignore their children. I work with families, so I see this all the time. Parents are ignoring their children and even their dogs when walking them because parents are too busy on their phones. This goes with both children and their pets. God help us. And um, yeah, good, good points there by Christine. And, and think about this, nobody wants to be doing this. Who, want, who got a dog for some sense of companionship to take the dog on a walk, but then be checking you know, on their smartphone while they're walking their dog? Who desires that? Who wants that? Who, who wants to ignore their child while they're just glued to their phone all the time? Nobody wants that. And yet these behaviors are commonplace. So what's going on here? These are very addictive devices is very, um, very dangerous in many ways. We're going to get to that as well as the good and what we can do to navigate it all. Stay tuned. The Catholic Current, bringing Christ to the world and the world to Christ. What kind of resistance are you getting in the social media forum? Have you been accused of misinformation, hate speech, thought crimes of any kind? Yes, yes, all of the above. We have been listed on the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center's list of hate groups, which, you know, these days, frankly, is a badge of honor. Any group that's doing work in this area that hasn't received that designation might want to ask if they're being affected. Um, <laughs> The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network presents Saints and Seasons. On April 8th, we celebrate the Feast of St. Perpetuus of Tours, Bishop and Confessor. Perpetuus was born in the 5th century to a noble French family. Among his relatives were his predecessor as Bishop of Tours, St. Eustachius, and also his successor, St. Volusianus. Perpetuus was made Bishop of that venerable see around the year 460, and spent the next three decades encouraging the sanctity of his flock by every means. He required fasting on most Wednesdays and Fridays throughout the year, with the exception of festive seasons after Easter, Christmas, and the Feast of St. John the Baptist. In an early observance of what would become Advent, he added a third fasting day each week between Martinmas, the November 11th Feast of St. Martin, and Christmas. Perpetuus honored his great predecessor, St. Martin of Tours, with a new church large enough to handle the many pilgrims who came seeking miracles at St. Martin's tomb. Though he possessed great wealth and property through his family inheritance, he left nearly all he owned to either the diocese or the poor, whom he directly named his heirs in his humble last will. He died in the year of our Lord 490 or 491, hailed as a true successor and imitator of St. Martin. Also honored on this day are Saints Herodian, Asyncretus, and Phlegon, disciples of our Lord, St. Julia Biliart, St. Dionysius of Corinth, and many other martyrs, confessors, and holy virgins. For more about the saints and seasons of the Catholic Church, visit thestationofthecross.com forward slash saints and seasons. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim and Becky Havens here. We are talking about smartphones, social media, and mental health today on Wholeness and Healing Monday here on The Simple Truth. We'd love to hear from you. If you have anything to ask, anything to comment on with regard to this topic, one 511 That's one 511 5483 
in the survey that we um, put out this morning, what effect do you think smartphones have on mental health? One more response uh, to share here. The one said, smartphones are likely a big source of anxiety because they provide access to too much, often, re- often irrelevant information that is not useful for a person's state in life. They can also be a source of distraction from what is truly important. And yeah, isn't that the truth? And again, just to get back to the point that we were uh, we were making that uh, Christine in uh, Massachusetts, Northborough, Massachusetts, was making uh, right before the last break, and and that was um, just the addictive nature of this. We're doing things mindlessly, grabbing for our phones without even really wanting to. Uh, There's an addictive aspect to this that is unconscious. Oftentimes, Um, how how many have had the experience where you all of a sudden kind of snap into consciousness and you're you're on your phone checking something on your phone and and thinking why am i even doing this what am i even doing and you realize that it's just a sort of a, an instinctual reflex, just a habitual thing that you find yourself doing over and over again sort of mindlessly Can we notice that? Can we step back and look at that and say there's something very disordered about this? So we have to have some controls on this. And we're talking about this new book that talks about the dangers uh, for children and for childhood. Those things are very real, um, but they're also real no matter what your age is as well. So if we can't control ourselves as adults, then it doesn't make much sense that we're going to be able to be teaching self-control with respect uh, to smartphones and social media uh, to our children or or grandchildren either. What is the example that we're showing them? How are we treating these things? Are we giving that example of, of self-control, of temperance, or or not? Are we just showing a certain certain bit of, of, of gluttony uh, when it comes to this and, and that example of disorder, um, which they m- probably know all too well in their own lives if they have these devices. We've got to, to show them the light on this by example and by word and, and by the way that we raise them up. Becky, your thoughts? Yeah, just thinking about it, it's so sad because you think back to your childhood and and there is such like a carefree um, feeling about it. I mean, whether you've had, you know, a difficult childhood or not, there is something that as a kid, you could just go outside and be happy it was sunny out. Do you know what I mean? And, you and, you know, you're spending time outside and, and playing with your friends outside and um, that is like gone almost. I think it's gone for adults too, like, like. The one, like somebody mentioned before, how you can't even take your dog out without having to check something. What are you going to miss that, you know, that won't be available there in 15 minutes when you get home? I think it's an addiction and I think we need to start looking at it differently. And if we start looking at it differently, we'll realize that, okay, we need to be like detoxed from this lifestyle, from our phones, and then we need to learn appropriate ways to use it. So the tricky thing is, is like, all right, if you have a business and it's primarily run on social media, then that becomes like a 24 seven open door to be on social media because you're probably constantly checking things or wanting to see like how your business is doing. Whereas like if you're working at a store, like you go to work and then you come home and that's it. And that's kind of how it was when we were younger, you would go to your job and you'd come home and, and that was the end of it. You know, like we survived without a phone. We survived without, you know, driving with phones and, um, I'd, I'd be curious to see what the statistics are on, you know, cr- like crashes and texting and all that, because I guarantee it's probably gone way up. Um, but I think we need to start looking at it as how do we detox from our phones? Because literally like our brain is becoming addicted to just checking this, checking that. And it's like a habit and you're getting some kind of like small high from checking um, and, it, and it brings you some kind of maybe like community that, that you're missing. You know, we're pretty isolated. COVID made people really isolated. And so they relied on social media and connecting through that. But I feel like it seems most people are forgetting to go outside and talk to their neighbors and to have regular conversations and especially the younger generation. And they're going to they're going to lose that sense of development that um, you would have in a normal upbringing of just talking to people outside of 
social media or outside of, I mean, you don't say things to people in person that you probably would say to them on social media. So I feel like there's something really big being lost here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great points. And, uh, you know, as you're talking about the addictive nature of the smartphone, social media, and, um, and this sort of reward that you get, this sort of pleasure that you get, um, yeah, that describes addiction quite well. Um, there's also a compulsive nature to this. And uh, as I just uh, remind myself here by looking up the, the distinction between addiction and compulsion, it says this, that often they're used interchangeably, but they're different. Addiction creates a sense of pleasure in the brain and removes discomfort from cravings compulsions involved in involve an overwhelming urge to do something but they don't create satiation in the brain's reward circuitry so i think we have both of these things at play here uh definitely uh the compulsion aspect of this as well again where you're not necessarily even receiving any reward or pleasure it's just something you are sort of obsessively doing compulsively doing without really being conscious of it that's why it makes sense to um, what oftentimes parents do for kids is which is a good practice is to say you're going to put your phone in this basket uh, from this time to this time you're going to be away from it you're going to be free from it this is a good thing you're going to have self-control you don't have to have your phone on you all the time well if that's a good practice for young people wouldn't it be good practice for older people as well can we have a place where we put our phones this is where i'm putting it for these times and i'm not going to touch it and you might find yourself in the beginning sort of compulsively or addictively wanting to go over there but you control yourself there's a bigger barrier to you grabbing it versus if it were just in your pocket or on the counter right next to you um, so even just that tiny little practice might help to understand your actual behavior surrounding the smartphone social media etc um, but this is also a big aspect you bring this out in, in your comments as well this is a big part of the the book that we were talking about here that kind of set this conversation going here today the anxious generation how the great rewiring of childhood is causing an epidemic of mental illness jonathan Haidt is the author and um, and so he he talks about um you know the smartphone and social media and all of that but there's another aspect to this a backstory a context of this that makes this all so much more detrimental of how this sort of perfect storm all comes together. This is how he describes it. He says, the decline of free play may be a large part of the backstory of the teen mental health crisis that began around 2012, along with changes to parenting practices, particularly the loss of our, of our autonomy and unsupervised play for children beginning in the 1990s, what has been called the coddling of the mind. And he also has a book called The Coddling of the American Mind. And some, including hate, believe that this is the largest single contributor interacting with the spread of social media that explains the rise of teen depression and anxiety and their behavioral correlates such as self-harm and suicide the data suggests that these trends exist throughout english speaking countries paranoid parenting overprotection safetyism walking on eggshells in universities and rising rates of teen depression anxiety and self-harm this is how he talks about the safetyism the overprotecting in an interview that i read he, he says quote as we were cracking down on play and independence and depriving kids of it the kids are getting weaker they're getting more fragile they're not fully developing but yet they're not depressed and anxious. It's only once you take these weaker children who've been play deprived and then you draw them into the virtual world and you cut off access to the real world, that's when mental health collapses. So it was not a gradual thing from the 80s on. It was a very sudden thing around 2012, 2013. And now I think that's exacerbated by COVID times, but some just want to point the finger and say COVID is to blame for all this. But this is something you can trace the data back very clearly to this sudden thing around 2012, 2013, the advent uh, of social media and the smartphone. Becky, your thoughts? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting, actually. It makes me wonder why a child would need a smartphone. What, a, what are... What's the use? Um, currently, our kids do not have that. Uh, I don't think I would, I don't think they need a phone unless maybe they're driving. And at that point, they would never need a smartphone. I feel like you're giving something to a child who 
they're not fully, he's right, they're not fully developed. So how can you expect them to control like this huge amount of information and temptation? Um, you're kind of putting them at risk for failing at, at certain ages, especially as they're younger. What do, what do parents think they're going to do with them? You know, use it wisely? There's no way that, that kids are using it wisely. Adults barely use them wisely. And so what I would ask parents is why, why does your child have a smartphone? What is, what is the need for it? Um, it honestly, what's the need for it for everybody? Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> is it cause everybody else has one? And so I want to try this out. I've gone back and forth so many times with like, just give me a flip phone. I do not want this temptation. You're trying to be a wife and a mother and, you know, homeschool your kids and you have the distraction. Um, you, you might be trying to use it for good and there are good things that you can use it for, but most of the time you get sucked in maybe to something there and then you get distracted and then you're like, okay, that was just 45 minutes that I was not attending to this need or that need. And, um, is the good outweighing the bad here? And, do, who really needs a smartphone? I guess that's my question. I'd love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the first thing to, to, I mean, there's a few thoughts here. One is that um, the addictive nature, the compulsive nature and, and the behaviors that uh, that go along with this, it's designed to control us in these ways. That is why that is why they are created. These are companies that want to keep us on there to sell advertising, and it's a it's about money, right? So the longer they can keep us on there, they can keep us glued or and locked into their system. The longer um, they have a, a customer on the hook, and um, and that's good for their their data for their numbers. Plus, they're yeah they're data mining us as well and getting all sorts of information about what our preferences are, what we like, what we don't like, what our buying habits are, all kinds of things that they're able to mine from our data. Uh, so there's a lot uh, a lot in it for them of why they want to make this, why they want to get us on there, why they want to keep us on there for as long as possible. And uh, they don't seem to care about anybody's mental health. They're not doing this for the good of society. Uh, this is something that they're doing for um, to make as much money as they possibly can. And I, I just, I think that seems quite clear or else they would design it differently to be more user friendly in a way that would make sense to not cause addiction and compulsion and to help people maybe little pop-ups from time to time saying, hey, you've been on this for this long, maybe take a break to help people to, to come back to consciousness. Who knows? Uh, there's various things that could be designed. But um, but also, I think you also make a very good point. Look, we homeschool our children. Um, I think that's a different world than if you're sending your children to any type of school where there are smartphones. A lot of schools allow smartphones in the school. Um, so I'd love to hear what experiences parents have who are sending their kids to school. Does the school allow smartphones? Is it, Even if they don't, is there still pressure because all these other kids have smartphones and then your child's coming home saying, I want a smartphone? Um, what is that experience like? Perhaps you could share it with us. Give us a call, 1-877-511-5483, one 511 5483 We'll be right back. This is Life News Radio. I'm Jim Anderson. Investigations into Face Act violence against pro-life and Christian targets are increasingly awkward. While one admitted arsonist is being treated with kid gloves, hundreds of violent cases remain embarrassingly unresolved. Meanwhile, peaceful pro-life protests are strictly scrutinized. Catholics, Presbyterians, and Muslims in Scotland are together opposing legalized arranged dying. A third effort in Parliament is being opposed by legislators concerned over problems like the decline of robust palliative and hospice care or the normalization of pressure on the marginalized to end life. In the Netherlands, those suicides saw a 20% jump just last year. This is Life News Radio. The View. The accurate view of the human person changes everything. The news you hear and see pertaining to the human person has the power to inform or misinform your opinions and what you do with the gift of life and what you allow your government to do. We hope you will carefully assess what you hear, read, and view. 
Abortion activists are upset that others are not. The implementation of pro-life laws in Florida is not generating what they call rage donations to fund out-of-state abortions. Florida pro-life activists are working confidently to earn a no vote on unlimited abortion in November. A Washington state man has lost his nursing license. Allegations say he used abortion drugs on his unwilling victim to end the life of his and her child. And while Tennessee state's attorneys are fighting to keep its abortion ban, its legislators have passed a state K-12 curriculum mandate that includes live actions Baby Olivia video with its concise explanation of human development before birth. For pro-life headlines delivered to your email address daily, sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim and Becky Havens here, Wholeness and Healing Monday, talking about mental health and smartphones and social media. If you have any comment or question on this, 1-877-511-5483. That's 1-877-511-5483. We did also ask in the survey, what effect do you think smartphones have on spiritual health? And here's a a few responses we got. One said, a lot. People are ignoring each other in the name of technology. People hide behind the shield of technology. Children and adults bully each other. And the list of things go on and on. It's a nightmare. Joe from Rentham, Massachusetts says, smartphones are extremely helpful. The apps are countless. Laudate has access to daily readings for both the old and new mass. When I travel, I often use masstimes.org to find a mass. If I'm just looking for scriptural references and can only remember a fragment of a passage, I just Google it. All these tools and many more are extremely helpful with spiritual growth. When I listen to this show, I most often listen using the iCatholic Radio app. Good points from Joe. Also, uh, one more here. Uh, The response is good and bad. Good because we can use them for good, like listening to your show, prayer apps, etc. So we, yeah, we appreciate the the good use of uh, using iCatholic Radio um, for sure. And so, yeah, there is something about also making use of our call to evangelization with respect to what's been called the digital continent, going out and proclaiming Christ there and and the Catholic faith there that he died to give us. Um, There is something very, very good about that, and we do need to be doing that. Um, But we have to be doing it wisely and not getting sucked in to the negative aspects of all of this. And and even so, even there are even dangers with respect to um, to Catholic media, Um, you know, just watching YouTube video after YouTube video, even if they're sermons, even if they're Catholic talks, it it almost becomes like it it can it can be just sort of almost like a form of entertainment or, um, you know, just kind of, again, sort of this passive, um, passive situation where you're sort of receiving this information, but then you're just going on to receive the next bit of information and the next bit of information, so on and so forth. Maybe there's something there that's helping in a in an intellectual formation, but really the way it's meant to work is when you hear a sermon, when you hear a homily, that's supposed to form you heart, mind, and soul, and then you're going out into the world, and then you're living it, right? You're not just going back and hearing another. There's a reason that you don't go to Mass and hear 10 sermons in a row. You hear one, and then you're supposed to go out and live the faith in the real world. So if we're getting trapped into just this digital space and never going out and and increasing our acts of faith, increasing our acts of love in the real world, there's something very disordered about that. Uh, But I do want to say one good thing that I really like about my smartphone. The number one thing I love about my smartphone, which is why I would never want to give up my smartphone, uh, is just for the use of the maps, the map feature, the GPS and all of that. That is one bit of advancement in technology uh, that I find extremely helpful. I I used to be printing maps off all the time. I remember in my younger years, printing them off and going on trips where you're, uh, you're, you're reading off the paper or unfolding the big map. Now, there's nothing that can still be a fun thing to do. And that's a fine way to go about it. That's how it used to be for a very long time. Um, But 
I, I got lost quite a bit. I got to say my sense of direction is not my best feature. And so that was uh, that was a trouble part for me that with the GPS, usually um, it, it does it does quite fine in helping me to navigate around um, in, in ways that just make it easier. I don't have to think too much about it. It just gives it to me. And then also, um, even when there's uh, traffic in a particular area, you can kind of scoot around it without getting sucked into it. So, um, so there's some helpful things there for sure. Um, but again, how does the good and, and the bad where does it um where, where does the scale come down i think the negative far outweighs the positive however can we make use of these devices making use of the positive features and then being very um very temperate and very uh, with, with our with our time on it but also uh, very very self-controlled very self-disciplined about what we're even using it for and i would just use this last example um you know it's a good practice when you go into a grocery store or any type of a store um to know what you're going in for. You go in, you get the thing, and then you get out. You don't go in and you wander around and say, what else do I want? You know, and just start filling the cart with stuff. Uh, might be might be fun, but it's not, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense if you're going about it that way. I think of the phone in the same way to, okay, I'm going to use it for this. I'm going to conscious, be conscious that I'm dipping in right now and I'm going to use it for this particular thing and then I'm going to get out. And um, I think for me, that helps make sense of, a good way to go about it, Becky. Yeah, you might have just been describing me as I go to the grocery store sometimes <laughs> <laughs> looking for what's on sale. I mean, grocery shopping takes some planning and sometimes I just go in and I just enjoy going slow. But that's a really great point because you have to remember like, is it the same amount of what you're absorbing to what you're putting out? So some people just go on social media <clears throat> to just like taken, taken, you know what I mean? They're constantly absorbing this information. Um, I think that should be like the minimum amount that, that you're doing. You should have that like at a very low percent of what you're taking in, but you can use it for, like you mentioned earlier, uh, evangelization or um, work. Some people, that's their job. That's how they, they promote their, their business or their company. And a lot, and it can be really great because it's free. It's free advertising a lot of times. Um, and so you, you want to go on and say, all right, I might spend five minutes, you know, looking at a few things I'm interested in and then timer goes off and now I'm going to create the content and put it out and whatever way God wants you to use that or whatever your mission is on online. But if there's no purpose, um, I, I don't see like why social media is necessary. What I struggle with for me is just like, I'm trying to do, you know, work, and put it out through social media because that's a really great outlet to share different things with and you can reach a lot of people. But there's always that aspect of trying to find the balance of um, you know, making sure you're not taking in too much as well because it is a constant distraction. Somehow it seems like they actually know what you're talking about. Sometimes it scares me. I'm like, do they know what I'm thinking? I was just thinking I needed that. And then it popped up and there's an ad or you're talking about it and then something pops up or you get a text message and somehow they know that to me is scary. So the maps thing, I know you're into the maps, but for me, I would 100% like still be printing from MapQuest if I could, because they know your location and, and they know where you're going and they know um, when you're coming home, if you have your locations on, and I hate that about that. And I hate the lack of privacy that, that you give up when, when you enter social media. And so you either have to just like take the plunge and say, all right, I don't care because I'm here to spread this mission or because I have to do it for work or, or whatnot. But if it's not necessary, um, I would, I would say, don't even use it. That That's my opinion. I, I wish that I could just kind of remove myself and just live in a bubble away from social media. But then you have kids and you want to be able to educate them on, on how to properly use them. I think it's a really tricky subject, you know, like you want to use it for good, but it's like kind of out of control and mostly always used um, without, you know, proper balance, it seems, you know. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, the number is open, one 511 We would love to hear from you today. Any comment, question that you have, one 511 uh, So the author of that book that we were talking about, Jonathan Haidt, he, uh, he suggests four ways to combat this when it comes to mental health and um, and the um, and the advent of the smartphone and what's going on right now, uh, sp- specifically the r- the rise of mental health issues overall, but but specifically with uh, with children. So he suggests four ways to combat that. He says number one, no smartphones before high school. Number two, no social media before the age of sixteen. Number three, no phones in schools. And number four, prioritizing real world play and independence. Um, so look, Jonathan Haidt, he, um, he, again, he's a, he's a social psychologist from NYU. I think his background is from his uh, Wikipedia page that it said that he was, has a, a, a Jewish background, but, um, but uh, currently I guess he's an atheist. Um, so that's where he's coming from with respect to, uh, with spirituality. And, and so look, I think what he's laying out here is kind of like a common sense, absolute minimum, right? No smartphones before high school, no social media before age 16, no phones in schools, prioritizing real world play and independence. So that's a good place, I guess, to start. Um, but I think there's, yeah, there's a lot more to it than just this. Um, but that's what he lays out as his four ways. Um, we asked you, in your view, what are some best practices regarding smartphones for the sake of our mental and spiritual health? Here are some of the responses we got. One, airplane mode at night or place in a tin can. Try not to place near your ear or your body. Another said, use your technology as necessary. Parental con- controls are absolutely necessary. Smartphones are not needed in school for any age student K through 12. If smartphones are used for positive reasons, such as being able to talk with your therapist, then that is an example of what is positive to be used for. Another said, limited screen time. Another said, put the phone down. Family and work time are a priority. Enjoy and use the helpful tools when you have time or have a compelling need. I do like listening even passively when listening to the app, but even still, I know when enough is enough and that at times it's just entertainment and not anything super critical that I have to do. Another, Katrina, told us, uh, delete social media, limit smartphones. When with family, put it away. Children should not have smartphones. Another said, uh, they say no blue light two hours before bed and I would charge it in another room than where you sleep. So we've talked about some of these things in the past, um, but really uh, the delete social media, what Katerina is talking about, uh, who wrote in, um, yeah, I find that deleting the the social media apps off the phone, um, that is key. So even if you have social media access, that you might use for time to time in work or whatever else, then um, you can do it on your computer. Um, But when it's on the phone, again, that's just, it's so easy just to click it kind of compulsively and then you're on it then you find yourself scrolling and it's like, what am I doing, right? So so I think that is, is helpful, but, but in general, all of this, to me is it does speak to there, you know, why, why it can be used for good or bad, but at the same time, you do wonder, is there something inherently negative about this, right? And the way that it takes us out of reality for long periods of time and has us uh, looking at this uh, computer that we're holding in our hand. That's why with all of this rise in talk about uh, these futurists like Ray Kurzweil, we featured some of his comments on the show a while back talking about, you know, that there's going to be all this technology coming where people are going to willingly put a microchip in their brain because after all, we have to walk around with my with our phones and I might forget where I put it. So wouldn't I rather just have it in my brain and then I can just have it access to it whenever I want. I can just live with it. I don't have to worry about where I put it or anything like that. And he's saying, look, people are going to willingly go along with this. And it's kind of scary because as you look at the behaviors in society right now, what people are willingly going along with in sort of a mind numbing way without even thinking about it, it's not that big of a leap when you, when you start to kind of think about what's going on and what could uh, transpire going forward. Um, so we'll see, but it's uh, it's something to consider. Is there something even inherently harmful 
uh, about it in general with the way that it's been constructed. And um, anyway, I think we can use our intellects to, to make best use of it. Um, but, um, but some things to consider. Becky, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I would say <laughs> there's not a whole lot that you can probably think of that it's like really used for good except for, and, and I'm, I'm not talking necessarily about a smartphone. I kind of mean like the social media. I think that's where most people's downfalls are. Um, even YouTube, I, f- I feel like um, there's such a, a way to <clears throat> get sucked in. And I would say everything has completely changed. So you go out to a restaurant and everybody's on their phone looking down. There's no community anymore. Um, we're all kind of just like, attached to a different reality like you're looking at people who you don't even know who they are and you're like invested in their life um they become like these mini celebrities and it's like everybody's five minutes of fame and they're trying to get there and it just seems like we know way too much about people and it kind of needs to to stop for the most part yeah there are those spiritual dangers of vanity as well of selfishness a disordered sort of self-love a um, there, there's a lot of things that, that you can look at and say yeah something seems pretty off about the way this is being used in terms of social media and uh, why even be a part of that um, yeah a lot of questions i've asked myself for sure but if you want to call in and let us know your thoughts one 511 we'll be right back In the New Testament's first letter of St. John, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, we read, And we have this confidence in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in regard to whatever we ask, we know that what we have asked him for is ours. It's incredible to realize how much God loves us, what he has promised us, and what he'll give us through our trust in him. Have you prayed for the Station of the Cross today? We would be grateful if you would remember us each day in your prayers, whether it's the Most Holy Rosary of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, the Liturgy of the Hours, the Most Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, or any other prayers you pray throughout the day. Please also pray for the intentions of your fellow Catholic radio listeners. It's so important for us to remember to keep one another in prayer. Please join us in a prayer to our guardian angel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O holy guardian angel, take care of our soul and body. Enlighten our mind that we may know the Lord better and love him with all our heart. Help us in our prayers so that we may not give in to distractions. Assist us with your advice so that we may see the good and carry it out with generosity. Defend us from the insidious snares of the enemy and sustain us in temptations that we may always be victorious. Remedy our coldness in our worship of the Lord. Cease not to protect us until you have brought us into paradise where we will praise our good God together for all eternity. Amen. Havens here. You can connect with Becky, by the way, and check out the good resources that she has available over at safehavensmama.com. That's safehavensmama.com. Talking about smartphones, mental health, spiritual health, social media, all of that, anything in between, anything you want to call and talk about, comments, questions, one 511 5483 that's one 5483 I believe we've got Rick in Massachusetts on the line. Rick, what are your thoughts today? Ah, lose all the technology. It has really done no good, as you know. Yeah, GPS, yeah, that's one thing. <laughs> Not that I would use one, but uh, we haven't gotten no better off from from it. If you could tell me how we have, I'd like to know. But but drive by any job site or whatever and oh, watch the kids get off the school bus. They all got their heads down. There's a cartoon years ago. It shows a vampire in an alley and he's got all these people with their heads down looking at their devices. And he says, wow, I just walked into a candy store. 
<laughs> well, that's about my comment, so I'd love to hear what you have to <laughs> think about it. Yeah, yeah, appreciate the call, Rick. Thanks for calling in, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, there's an argument that people make to say, well, this is just like all of the other technologies that have come down the pike throughout the years, you know, when radio first came about, I'm sure there were people saying, oh, this is terrible. This is going to be bad for society. When the television came, you know, lots of people saying this is a, a really terrible thing for society. Now, they may have been right about both of those things. It depends what the content is. What is it being used for? Um, and when it comes to smartphone social media, um, I think it's, yeah, I mean, uh, what is it being used for? But also, I, I do wonder if there's something inherently different about it. I've not put enough thought or study into the matter myself, but is this just, you know, another piece of technology and uh, technology is really the issue? At what point, I guess, is technology the issue is uh, you go back to the agrarian lifestyle. Um, are, are we still allowed to use uh, mechanical tools? I mean, at what point, right? There, there's a whole timeline of technology. At what point do we say, yeah, this is the point and the rest of it, uh, no more from here on. You know, I don't know about that, but I would say there's something about the social media um, experience and the smartphones and w this combination of what's taking place and then exacerbated by what uh, this, uh, the, this social psychologist is saying, um, this sort of coddling of children that makes them very weak. And then we give them these devices and they uh, it just preys on them very easily. But I would say, again, it preys on us as adults as well, who might be a little bit stronger and tougher in many ways, but still we have a real hard time with it. So I don't know about doing away with technology altogether. I'm not really sure exactly what that means. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, there is is some uh, question for me at least still about is there something different about this medium about this medium of the smartphone and social media the combination of them um, maybe at this particular time but I think the medium in general th there may be something a bit different than just the television and the radio and saying it all just depends on what content it is um, I don't know but there does seem to be something uh, particularly addictive compulsive about it that um, it is far more expansive, far more comprehensive, far more um, sort of powerful than radio and television. Becky, what are your thoughts on it? I, it seems as though that's the point of social media is, and that's why they developed that particular way is because they want people on it. And it probably makes them a ton of money and it keeps, it keeps it going. If people stop going on social media, then these companies are going down and, and they have a whole lot invested. And so isn't it true the way that they um, present social media is to be addicting and to have people plugged in constantly? Um, and so it's, it's like mind boggling to hear what we were talking about earlier with the chips in the brains and how you can just think something and it communicates to another person. And, but that's, you know, that sounds crazy to us, but I'm sure like if we talk to your grandma, she would say social media is crazy. <laughs> you know, like cell phones like that are crazy. It doesn't make sense. Um, now that would be a big jump, like the phones to a chip in your brain because we have had radio and, and television to slowly guide. So that that would be a, a, big, a big jump. But it does seem that, you know, we were normalized on television. I'm sure generations ago they were not. And so that was something that came and, and there did seem to be a lot of pushback when the television came and um, it was, I can't, I can't remember if this was a saint or somebody said it was like um, the gateway to the devil or, or something along those lines. And I know that sounds extreme, but how, how many times does the devil come through, uh, you know, movies and um, what's on TV and, and how, how bad TV has gotten even since I was a kid, even though it was bad when I was a kid, but it's like way, way worse. So I, I like, I'm kind of with Rick, what he said. I, I'm kind of like, just like get rid of it all and go back to the old days where kids can be kids and adults go to block parties and hang out with their friends. And um, it's okay that you don't know everybody. It's okay that you don't know what's going on in everybody's life. And and the ins and outs of their kitchens and their houses. And it's like such a distraction. And it's, I feel like the best thing you can do is just to 
like kind of get rid of that stuff. Like for me personally, it's really easy for me just to like unfollow people. Or if I tend to like look at, you know, someone who does like house decorating, I'm like, oh, that house is so beautiful. I'm like, I think I should just unfollow them because I'm wanting to live in their house. (laughs) Hmm. I'm like, I have a perfectly beautiful house here. Like that is not good. You know, it's, it's creating like a type of, you know, I'm not like envious. I don't want them to not have that house, but I'm, I'm desiring something that I don't need to be desiring. And so I think, um, I used to be so careful on social media. I, I honestly think it's for most of the time, it's just not even necessary. Yeah. Yeah. It can definitely give rise to uncharitable thoughts and, um, and yeah, desires, disordered desires like jealousy, envy, uh, things of that sort as well. So yeah, good points. Let's get Judy in Massachusetts uh, in here with us. Judy, your thoughts today. Hi, um, I've just done some journaling on this. I'm going to go kind of quickly because I don't know how much time we have, but it just goes like this. Um, There is now upon us a plague of bigger electronic barns. If the clutter of too many things hadn't introduced chaos and disorder into our, our rightly ordered lives, we now have electronic means to add to that. We've got galleries of electronic photographs but no albums in our own homes. They have them all while we, while we have none. Where is our longing to immerse ourselves in God's creation, a good book, a magazine, a puzzle, a craft? Those moments of tenderness, joy, and warmth that come with their own videos, their own scripts, their own still shots, their own gifts, and which can never be duplicated or replaced by any of this. Perhaps there was wisdom in simplicity. Perhaps simplicity was God's plan. After all, wasn't it his design? He didn't give us all these absolute necessities. We did. What God instilled in us was a need for God, man, woman, family, heaven, and whatever would be helpful and necessary for us to attain that end. Conversely, YouTube is nothing about you and everything about somebody else, their values, their beliefs, their interests, their ideas, etc. And what results is a sort of patchwork quilt of everybody else, none of whom are your own friends and relations. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I think we're just about to hit the music, Judy. But uh, but but yeah, okay. one more line if you got one. Okay. Incidentally, there does not seem to be any benefit to those vulnerable to being preyed upon, set forth. Uh, All right. All right. Yeah, we're going to have to cut it there, uh, Judy. But uh, Judy, thank you so much for calling in, sharing that with us. I think it's just. Another example, too, of um, of how we can get so distracted and and lose our focus. I think that's what you're bringing us back to, the focus on what is most important, what we're made for, right? Creation, community, all of these good things that we get pulled away from by this little box we hold in our hand and in this little uh, artificial world that we get sucked into on social media, which is everybody, uh, I guess, trying to put various impressions out there that uh, are, are varying in degrees of, of even honesty and reality um, at all. And so um, there's a lot there, but I do think fundamentally, what is this doing to our prayer lives as well? Like, are we being truly recollected in heart and mind? Do we have time to think? Do we have time to pray? God bless you all. If the cares and anxieties of life are weighing you down, come to the St. Thomas More House of Prayer and allow the Lord to refresh your soul. The St. Thomas More House of Prayer is a Catholic retreat center devoted to praying and promoting the Liturgy of the Hours. You'll find a tranquil atmosphere that's ideal for deep prayer, whether as an individual or for a group retreat. We're located